is the promise worth the requirement? I'm taking my text from 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. This is a scripture that probably most of us could even repeat uh, just from memory because we've heard it so many times. 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. The title of the message is, Is the Promise Worth the Requirement? 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray, and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven, and I will forgive their sin, and will heal their land. He said he would forgive the sin and he would heal the land. But there are some requirements that we must meet first before he does that. So is the promise worth the requirement? Let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning. Lord, we're thankful so much again once that you've brought us into your, your fellowship this morning. Lord, that you've been gracious enough to heal bodies that need healing. You've given salvation where salvation is needed, Lord. You've given the Holy Spirit when we need the Holy Spirit. You've answered prayers to it for us this past week. And now this morning, we're here together once again to learn of you, to hear your word, Lord. And I pray this morning that you anoint each and every word that's spoken. And I pray that you anoint the ears that they hear and anoint mostly the heart to understand what you would have us to learn this morning. We want to be sure to give you the thank- thankful and the praise in your name. Amen. There was a notice in a church bulletin in Australia a while back. It gives us a glimpse of how several people can look at the same exact thing and have a different story or different outlook on it. But they'll gain a different perspective, but yet they won't realize the source of the deliverance. Here's what the bulletin said. A man fell into a pit, and he couldn't get himself out. A subjective person came along and said, I feel for you down there. An objective person walked by and said, It's logical that somebody would fall in down there. A Pharisee said only bad people fall into pits. A mathematician calculated how he fell into the pit. An IRS agent came along and asked if he was paying taxes on the pit. (laughs) A self-pitying person came along and said, you haven't seen anything until you've seen my pit. A fire and brimstone preacher said, you deserve the pit. Christian scientist observed, the pit is just in your mind. A psychologist came along and said, your mother and father are to blame for you being in the pit. A self-esteem therapist said, believe in yourself and you can get out of the pit. The optimist came along and said, things could be worse. The pessimist claimed, things will get worse. Jesus, seeing the man, took him by the hand and lifted him up out of the pit you know God is our source of deliverance from all the trials heartaches that we have in this life but we have to be willing to admit that we need help we have to be willing to admit that we need him to help us that we need deliverance we have to also admit that God is the only one that can help us how many times have you tried to help yourself you know the old phrase Just pull yourself up by the bootstraps and you'll be okay. Well, sometimes that's easier said than done. Most of the time, we need somebody else to come along and help us get up, and most of the time, nobody can do it because they're just bad off as we are. God is the only one that can deliver you out of heartache, trial, and problems a lot of times. How many times have you had something on your heart that you just didn't have anybody to talk to about it? Your very best friend couldn't help you, but God could. Did you ask him? Or did you try to figure it out yourself? How many times we try to figure out ourselves? You have to admit that God is the only one that can help you because his son, Jesus Christ, has already paid the price for our sins. So just like the man in the pit who couldn't get out by himself, no other person is able to furnish the solution to you. You know, when it all comes down to it, you're going to find out eventually. You go around the mountain, mountain time after time after time, and you're going to eventually find out the only solution is the cross of Christ. That's the only solution to every problem that you have in life, big or small. 
whether it's healing, whether it's salvation, whether it's answer to a money problem, whatever it is, Christ is the only one that can help. And guys, let me tell you something else. God does not have a special plan just for you. You know why? He went to the cross one time for all of mankind, for all the sins. We're all in the same boat. Paul said in Romans 3.23, we were all sinners. Born into sin. Jesus didn't have to go and do something special just for you and not somebody else. What he did was good enough for everybody. It covers all things we have. It covers all our dilemmas. In our text this morning, we just read God said he would help us. But first, there are four things we need to do. Four things we need to do first. And I call them requirements. Four requirements before we're going to get his threefold blessing. First of all, he tells us to humble ourselves. David said in Psalm chapter 51, verse 17, The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. Unquote. Jesus said the kingdom of heaven was going to belong to those who are humble. Humble. Meek. The humble person knows, number one, that he's a sinner. A humble person knows, number two, that he needs help. And he knows he can't do it on his own. He's humble. Humility. That doesn't mean you let people walk over you. What it means is you have a spirit and a heart for God. And you know that you need help from someone other than yourself. And so he said we have a broken and a contrite heart. What does contrite mean? It means that we are repentant. We ask the Lord to forgive us of what we've done wrong. Guarantee you, when you got up this morning, you probably did something you weren't supposed to do. Unless you're superhuman. (laughs) And what I'm talking about is not just in action. Sometimes we have thoughts that go through our minds. Sometimes it's action. Sometimes it's just attitude. So God has to deal with us on a daily basis, individually. But we have to have a humble heart. A person who is humble is one who has admitted he's a sinner by recognizing his faults. A person who is humble is also realizing he's spiritually poor without the help of the Holy Spirit. So one who is humble in spirit will be willing to sacrifice their desires and replace them with the will of God. Boy, that's hard. You know, for some folks, that's extremely hard. Because we're stubborn, stiff-necked, and rebellious. Scripture even talks about that. It says you're stiff-necked. We're stubborn. We don't like to call us stubborn. We just like like to say we're perseverant. You know, I can be pretty stubborn at times, but I'd rather not use that word. I'd rather say I persevere. I'm persistent. (laughs) But stubborn. Scripture says we're stiff-necked and stubborn and rebellious a lot of times. You can't be a humble person if you're going to be that way. We have to be able to give in to, to God's will. That's a stronghold, though, that Satan has on so many people, and church people are no exception. Satan doesn't really bother the ones who don't come to church. He doesn't really bother the ones who don't worship God anyway. He doesn't really bother the ones who are trying to do God's will. He leaves them alone. Why? He's already got them. Why fight for them? He's already got those people. The ones he's going to try to mess with, the ones he's going to try to bother, the ones he's going to harass are the ones who are trying to do God's will. Somebody told me this morning, you know, they've been having a hard time, and I said, well, bless your heart. (laughs) Don't we all? You know, it's a daily fight to understand that you have things that come up in your life. You have uh, battles that come up. But like I said a while ago, I read the back of the book, We Win the War. We win. We have battles that we come up against every single day. And that's why we have God and the Holy Spirit to help us get through those battles. Battle a day at a time, a day at a time. You're not ever going to get through them until you get to heaven. But the war is going to be won. It's already been won. We have the victory already in the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? The next thing God tells us that we should do is to pray. Jesus instructed us to pray the Lord's Prayer. He prayed for His will. Well, now God can say that Jesus is going to pray for God's will to be done and that's what he did when he was in the garden of Gethsemane don't you think maybe we should do the same thing what's good for Jesus is good for us if he was supposed to pray for God's will then we should do the same thing we should pray we should be humble about it 
In the parable of the man who went to the neighbor in the middle of the night, I'm sure you remember that parable that Jesus spoke about. He went to his neighbor, knocked on the door in the middle of the night. The neighbor didn't want to get up. The man just kept knocking. The neighbor finally got up. He said, what is it? What do you want? The man said, I just need some bread. I've got people in my house. I need food. I need bread to feed them. The man said, I don't have any. Go away. Come back in the morning. Leave me alone. How many would you like to get up at 2 o'clock in the morning to give somebody something? I'd rather just say, come back at 8 o'clock tomorrow morning. I'll be awake. I'll be ready to meet you then. The man didn't leave. He came back and he says, I still need something. I need some bread. The neighbor says, okay, just to get rid of you, I'll give you what you want. If the man had not come back and kept knocking and kept asking and been persistent about it, he would have gone home empty-handed. You see, when we pray, we have to be persistent about it. The Lord said, pray until you receive. Now, if he tells you absolutely not, you can't have what you want, then quit. And you'll know that. And when he tells you that, sometimes he does that. Because if we pray according to God's will, he's going to tell you, yes, it's okay for you, or no, it's not. And that's how we need to pray, is according to God's will, not our will. So when we pray according to God's will, be persistent about it. Be persistent. Elijah was a righteous man. He prayed. And when he prayed, things happened. You see, he didn't understand and didn't believe that God would not change anything if he kept praying. Well, Elijah prayed for rain. It hadn't rained for three and a half years, but then it was time to start raining, and Elijah prayed for it. Right? Scripture says Elijah was a, was a righteous man. And the prayer of a righteous, fervent person will make a change. You can change the course of nature when you pray. It's not that God changes, but that we change in what we're doing and the way we look at things. How many times have you prayed for something to happen and then God's taken care of it and you thought, wow, that was amazing. God really fixed that person. That person I didn't like and that person I couldn't get along with, God really fixed that person over there and made them better. No, God made you better so that you're able to meet them and you're able to deal with them. Because that's the way God works. Faith is contrary to Scripture. That's the paganistic attitude. What's going to happen? What's going to happen? You know, it's unchangeable. Nothing can change it. No, that's faith. That's paganistic. God says pray and be persistent, and he will see to it your needs are met. Next, God tells us we should seek him and his ways. We can't possibly know what the ways of God are unless we what? Communicate with him. And unless you read the word. That's why I was excited this morning to hear that Aiden has been reading the scripture. He's doing this on his own. He's 11 years old. Now, if an 11-year-old can get in there and do it on his own, an adult can do it. Amen. Amen. He doesn't have somebody stand over his head telling him to read the scripture. He's in a home where they don't even go to church. So there's no excuse for adults not to read the word of God. And when you don't read the word, you're not going to know the will of God. If you don't communicate with your boss at work, you're not going to know what to do. If you don't communicate with your teachers, you're not going to do, I know how to do the homework. Do they even have homework anymore? Okay. <laughs> I was beginning to wonder. <laughs> but if you're a teacher and you don't communicate, you're not going to know what to do. You're not going to know how to get out of that grade, how to do the next one. You've got to communicate. Same with, same with God. If you don't communicate with God, how do you think he's going to talk to you? How do you think he's going to let you know what needs to be done? We're not all perfect yet. We still need help. <laughs> Amen? Amen? And we need for him to communicate with us. That comes through his word. <clears throat> so we need to be persistent in that. We need to seek him. Isaiah 55, verse 6 says, Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. That tells me that if we quit calling on the Lord, there may be one of these days where he might. He might just move away a little bit there. If we completely, if you completely turn your back on God and don't continue to be with Him and communicate with Him, He will eventually leave you alone. First Chronicles sixteen eleven tells us we need to seek the face continually. Seek the face of God continually. Even as we speak today, there are people in our nation who are working extra, extra hard to make sure that we don't have the freedom that we need. I even heard last night they were, they were trying to have a meeting somewhere in a, in a government meeting of some sort up in Washington. 
opened with prayer and immediately somebody started rebelling and protesting against it. That happened yesterday. We're becoming a nation that is right now at the very most important crossroads in our history. I know we've had problems in the past. I know that we've had situations in the past where it's been hard to do certain things, but I'm telling you right now, there are times right now that we're going through when there are so many people, you cannot do anything as a believer without somebody saying something about it eventually. And I guarantee you, the more you start talking about Scripture, the more you're going to get some flack. The more you start standing up for Jesus Christ, the more you're going to have a problem. Are you going to quit? Or are you going to keep on? Jesus requires us to do some things. If we don't do what he requires, guess what? He doesn't have to fulfill his promise to us. Amen? We have turmoil, protest every day. We have people in authority who are allowing and practicing the idea of taking away our freedom. They are working doubly hard to take away our freedom, people. It would be so easy if they would just let us worship and let us have the freedom we were supposed to have in the first place. But no, Satan is there and he's doing his very best to take that away from us. Christians are praying for revival, praying for God to allow us to have a leader that will let us worship. Well, right now we have one. We have one right now. But let me make it clear to you. I appreciate the one that's in there right now is our president. We need to pray for him every single day. And I thoroughly appreciate the fact that God has allowed that person to be in there because we do have some freedom. I don't know if you're paying attention or not to what he's been doing, but when he speaks, he talks about freedom for the churches, freedom to worship however you want to worship. He's not telling you how. You have to understand that's freedom for everybody to worship their God the way they want to, okay? But... Let me warn you, you cannot depend on one man to do it. Hear what I'm saying? No matter who's in there, don't just depend on him. Don't put all your eggs in one basket, so to speak. You need to start, still continue to depend on the Lord. Think not that any mortal man would be able to deliver you from the perils that we face today. It's not up to that one man to do that. We need to search to seek God. Our nation is rapidly becoming like Germany Germany, in the time of Hitler. Let me just give you a little bit of information there. Hitler came into power in July 1933. Before he came into power, Germany was actually a pretty good Christian station, a nation, I should say. The church was strong. They had a lot going for them. But Hitler came in, and he began to change things up. He used the effects of the Depression. You know, you've heard us People are talking about the Depression of 1929. Uh, it affected the world, not just the United States. And Hitler used that and the effects of that to his advantage. He was able to take control of that because the people were hungry, unemployed, and desperate to survive. That's all it took. He stepped right in there. And what he did was he came in and gave a bunch of lies, and people began to believe it because they were hungry. When you're hungry, you'll do a whole lot of things you shouldn't do. Amen? If it was not for the fact that the church had lost their strength and they began to fall into the trap of what he was setting, if the church had been strong, he would not have been able to take over. But the church was not as strong as they should have been, and he came in and he took over because he got the church to believe his lies also. He never could have succeeded in power if they had been strong if they had rejected his ideology. But the church began to look at the man instead of seeking God's face. You see, they began to look at Hitler saying, oh, he's, he's the one that's going to save us. He's going to bring us out of this economic depression that we're in. They were hungry. They were unemployed. They were just trying to survive. If you have kids and you're trying to feed them, you're going to do what you have to do to feed those children. So he came in and took over. The main problem with the church was that they let him persuade them 
to do it according to what he wanted them to do instead of them depending upon God. And that led to the devastation in the country and led to the slaughter of millions of people. Millions of people. It wasn't long before Hitler began to take away the freedoms and indoctrinating, indoctrinating the children into believing that they did not have to respect or obey their parents or authority. They did not even have to worry about thinking for themselves. Now I'm telling you about what happened in Germany. In the next few minutes, I want you to listen and think about what's happening in our nation today. I know for a fact that right now in schools, the teachers are telling the children, don't you worry about that. I'll tell you what to do. You don't have to worry about trying to figure something out. It's too much for you. I'll tell you what to do. You follow the crowd. Let me tell you something. The group never saved anybody. This is the individual thing here. You better get your mind straight and learn how to think for yourself, okay? But it's not just the children. Adults right now, we are falling right into the trap of what the protesters are wanting us to do. And let me give you some examples here. We're seeing the same thing happen today. Children are not motivated or challenged to think for themselves. You've got to challenge children. You've got to challenge them and make them think for themselves. Instead, they're in they are encouraged to follow what the group as a whole is doing. Scripture plainly states salvation comes by making a choice. You seek the Lord, you make a choice. The group is not going to help you. The group is not going to... When it comes right down to it, it has to be an individual relationship with Jesus Christ. Several years ago, Dr. Chester Pierce from Harvard University was speaking to a group of 2,000 teachers. They were in a seminar in Denver. And he gave a frightening idea of what the teacher's responsibility was. And he was quoted in a book. The title of the book is Globalism, America's Demise. William M. Bowden wrote it. And here's the quote. Dr. Pierce, he said, Every child in America who enters school at the age of five is mentally ill because he comes to school with allegiance toward our elected officials, toward our founding fathers, toward our institutions, toward the preservation of this form of government. Patriotism, nationalism, Sovereignty, all that proves that children are sick because the truly well individual is one who has rejected all those things and is what I would call the true international child of the future, unquote. Did you get what I just said? What he is basically saying is children should not think for themselves. Now, this happened just recently, a few years ago. This is the same philosophy that Hitler had when he came into power, and he's not the only one. I'm just having to pick on him this morning. But what I'm trying to tell you is if you have a society that does not think for themselves, they're going to be right in the grips of what Satan wants them to do. And how easy it is to be influenced if you don't think for yourself. You heard the old adage, the blind leading the blind. Well, guess what? That's a perfect example. They're blind as a bat, and they're leading everybody else right down the same path. We have got to be able to stand up against this. When the church in Germany stopped praying and stopped seeking God for all things, the lifestyle and philosophy of the German culture changed to the point that they lost their moral values. But before you start throwing stones at Germany, let's look at what's happening in our country today. Okay? We're no better off today. When we explain that homosexuality is just an alternative lifestyle instead of blatant sin. When we say that adultery is merely an affair. When we are sure that abortion does not involve a living human being. And we are merely told that the laws that control our religious speech are simply the fairness doctrine. You know, you've heard that lately, the fairness doctrine. In other words, we can't say what we want to say about religion or about Jesus Christ. When we're accused of hate speech and racism, when we distinguish between a believer and an unbeliever, when we are criticized and challenged for putting up a nativity scene or saying the word Christmas, 
And when we're told that it bothers the minority of the population when we pray at a school function or at a government meeting, we're in serious trouble. It's basically something that's been happening the past few years, and do you know where I put the blame? Right at the church. If the church had stood strong, we would not be in the position we're in today. And I'm talking about the church around the world. We have let things go for so long, and now it's to the point where it's just almost unrepairable. Now, God can do anything. He did it with the Israelites. When Elijah prayed for rain, what did he do? God sent rain. God can do anything, but that's only through prayer. The church has not sought God. We have decided that we would rather go with the majority of the people and not offend anybody by preaching the truth. And this is where it's going to get tough, people. I tell you right now, if we start teaching and preaching the truth and continue to do that, we're going to have some, we're going to have some slack. You might as well get ready. And I'm asking you right now, everyone within the sound of my voice, if you believe in Jesus Christ and you believe that we need to teach the truth and preach the truth, you need to keep praying. And I mean pray every single day because there's going to be things happening. If we want things to happen for God, we're going to have to pray about it. Guess what? Jesus offended people every day. Is that a surprise to you? You know, we had this picture of Jesus Christ walking down the road or sitting down to eat with people, and everybody just loved on him and just, oh, I mean to tell you, they just accepted everything he said, and they were just as happy as a lark to please to follow after him, and they were just loving it and loving it. Guess what? There's an eye-opener. The majority of the people didn't like what Jesus said. The majority of the people turned and left. And when, he, when they found out that he was preaching the word, and preaching the scripture, and he was going to stand true to it, they really didn't like it. They got offended. You tell me and show me in the Bible where it says if you preach the truth, you're going to have a big following. Show me that scripture. I've never found it yet. If they didn't follow Jesus, guess what? You probably won't have a big following either. Oh, now there's some big churches that have a lot of people. And every big church that has a lot of people, don't, don't leave out here telling me that I'm, don't go tell everybody that I'm condemning all those churches. That's not what I'm saying. <laughs> there are some big churches that have big congregations and the pastors preaching the word of God. But I can tell you there's more big churches with big congregations where the pastor does not preach the word of God. He's got a little bit in there. A little bit. You know, what do they say about the one bad apple and the whole barrel can spoil it? A little bit of yeast, Scripture talks about a little bit of yeast will spoil it. Well, what they do is they put a little bit of the truth in there and hope that's going to save them. That little bit of truth is not enough to get them over the, over the bump. We're not going to make it. So most of your big churches right now that have thousands of people coming are not getting the truth they're the ones that have the itching ears you know what itching ears mean when you have an itching you want to itch somewhere you want to scratch it to make it feel right right whatever the scripture talks about people with itching ears people with itching ears are ones who want to hear something to make them feel good it doesn't mean it's the truth but they just want to feel good feel good go home be done with it come back next Sunday if they were to have to sit there and listen to the truth, they'd half more of them would get up and leave. There goes the congregation. So Jesus offended people. He allowed them to crucify him in order that we may have eternal life. And he made more enemies than his friends. And you will too if you preach the truth. People have lost their lives because they have sought God rather than be popular. Let me give you an example. Dietrich Bonhoeffer is a prime example. Bonhoeffer was a Lutheran pastor and theologian, and he was there during the time of Hitler. And he became a powerful spokesman for Christianity. When Hitler came into practice, he required all the teachers and the pastors to sign an allegiance to him. In other words, sign a pact with the devil, basically, is what they were having to do. What he told them was, if you sign with me and you agree with me, 
you teach what I tell you to teach and you preach what I tell you to preach and we'll be okay. So we won't have any problems. And guess what most of them did? They signed. Bonhoeffer didn't sign. He and several other, about 800 of them, decided not to. And they made their own, their own church that was basically not in Hitler's realm. Most of them were arrested and imprisoned. In the book that, one of the books that Bonhoeffer wrote, he said, and I quote, Cheap grace is the deadly enemy of the church. In such a world, the, in such a church, the world finds a cheap covering for its sins. No contrition is required, still less any real desire to be delivered from sin. Cheap grace means the justification of sin without the justification of the sinner. Cheap grace is grace without discipleship, grace without the cross, grace without Jesus Christ living and, in, living and incarnate, unquote. Bonhoeffer paid a price for his leadership and his profession of faith in Jesus Christ. Guess what happened to him? He was 39 years old and they hanged him on the gallows because he didn't agree with Hitler. In our text, the last thing that God says we should do in order to be blessed by him is to turn from our wicked ways. Throughout scripture, he tells us to turn from our wicked ways and turn back to him. He even tells us in 2 Chronicles 29, verse 11, My sons, be not now negligent, for the Lord hath chosen you to stand before him, to serve him, and that you should minister unto him. Unquote. We need to genuinely repent from all of our sins, whatever they might be. One of the greatest sins that we do today, and Christians do the same thing, is conformity to the world. And think about how many times you have conformed to what the world wants you to do because it was easier to do it. We need to draw near to him for mercy, forgiveness, and cleansing. It's sad but true that most people will sell their souls for a little bit of pleasure. And during a time of persecution, will even unless a person is sold out to God, they will sell their soul for a piece of bread. It's been said and it's been substantiated that communism began back when Lenin promised, I will put bread in every kitchen. And basically what he was saying, you do what I want you to do and I'll feed you. Same thing Hitler did when he came along. How many people have sold their souls for that? Listen to what Benjamin Franklin said. He said, any society that would give up a little bit of liberty to gain a little security will neither deserve, will deserve neither and lose both. You will lose liberty and security and you don't deserve it if you're willing to give up a little bit. Satan in Job chapter 2 verse 4. You remember Satan was having a conversation with God. God was saying, you go ahead. See what you want to do with Job. He's my man, but you go ahead. Job can handle it. And say, no. He said, you've got a hedge around him. And God told him, go ahead. And here's what Satan said. He was battling for the soul of Job. He told God, all that a man hath will he give for his life. And basically, that's what was happening in Germany, and that's what's happening today in this nation when people are giving up their salvation because they're trying to conform to the world. They're trying to do what the easy way. They're trying to take the easy way out. Nobody said being a Christian was going to be easy. It can be happy because you know what the end result is. It didn't say it was going to be easy. There's going to be problems. The difference between a Christian and a non-Christian is when you have a problem, you've got somebody to turn to that can help you get through it. A non-Christian would just make it worse on you. In Acts chapter 4, Peter and John had been released from prison. And the councilman told him, y'all just need to leave town, quit preaching about this Jesus Christ, and just leave us alone. And what they did was they told them and they said, you know what, we would rather obey God and preach about God than to obey man. And that's what we are going to have to do. We need to make a decision to obey God rather than man kind of reminds me of the three Hebrew children when they were thrown into the fire. Why were they thrown into the fire in the first place? King Nebuchadnezzar had made a statue for himself. 
And he told the three children to bend down and kneel down and, and bow themselves to that statue and pray. And they said, no, we're not going to do it. He said, well, okay, then I'll just throw you in the fire. And they said, well, okay, then throw us in the fire. They didn't know that God was going to deliver them from that fire. You have to understand, when they went into that fire, they immediately thought they were going to be burned to death. They didn't know they knew God could deliver them, but they didn't know God was going to deliver, deliver them. That's the difference. If you know and you know that God's going to do something for you, isn't it easy to do it? But if you don't know for sure that God's going to take care of you, because you don't know how God's going to answer your prayers, sometimes it's harder to do the will of God. Amen? Hebrew children, they went and they said, well, okay, then throw us in the fire. We're ready to die. Because when we die, we know we're going to heaven. We're not making it down here. All we're doing down here is if we bow down to you, we're going to have a life. The rest of our life is going to be really miserable because God's going to get us. <laughs> and we'll be judged. So they took the best way out, the quickest way out. They said, throw us in the fire and see what happens. He threw them in the fire and what happens? Three of them walking around. They weren't even dying yet. They were walking around. How, how can you walk around a fire? And then they said the fire got seven times hotter. Killed everybody else standing around, but it didn't kill them. How do you explain that? Nebuchadnezzar looks down and he says, I thought we threw three people in there. How come there's a fourth one walking around? <laughs> Scared him. Scared him. About that time, he says, open up that door and let those three men out, and whoever that other guy is, and let him out too. You know, you have to understand when God tells you to do something, he's going to make a way. It may not be the way you think it should be, but he'll make a way. But we have to be understand that today in this period of time that we're living in right now, there are more people being martyred right now than there have been all through history. You see, we don't hear about that. Because we're in this, what do they call it now, the safe space? How many of you saw the interview last night? Or what show was it on? Carlson? I don't remember now. No. The other show, Greg show. They have a man and woman who have a band in Austin. Don't remember their name. She is a young lady that came from Bosnia. Now, if you remember anything about Bosnia a few years ago, they were in a war over there. Remember that? People were bombing, killing people. It was a bad thing. But this young girl, as a young girl, escaped and she came to America. And she had to work a long time to get a green card to to be able to work in America and now I think now she's she's probably a citizen or whatever. But she made a comment on something and she immediately had protesters protesting against her. And the man that was interviewing her said something about, well, what does it feel like? And she said, you know what? People don't understand. She said, America is a safe space. You don't understand what it's be like. She said, I left and I came out of a country that was involved in a war. This is a safe space and yet people are protesting and people are trying to get you to hush up and not say what you need to say. Now, she wasn't witnessing about Jesus Christ, so don't misunderstand me. But what I'm just trying to tell you is she was saying, this is a good place here. People are not being killed on the streets, and killed. people are not being martyred all the time like they are in other countries. But right now, people are being martyred a lot. So God said we need to humble ourselves and pray to him with a sincere heart, seek his face and his will, turn from our sinful ways, turn toward him, and he would promise and fulfill his promise to heal, hear, forgive, and heal our land. So he will hear our sincere prayers and will begin to answer our heart's desire as long as it's according to his will. Psalm 102.2 says, Hide not thy face from me in the day when I am in trouble, and climb thy ear unto me. In the day when I call, answer me speedily. God's merciful. He told Joel in Joel chapter 2, verse 18 and 19, then will the Lord be jealous for his land and pity his people. Yea, the Lord will answer and say unto his people, Behold, I will send you corn and wine and oil, and you shall be satisfied therewith. Now listen to this. And I will no more make you a reproach among the heathen. Leading up to and during World War II, the Jewish people were considered inferior people. And when you really read about the history of it, the Germans and other people, and I'll tell you right now, the United States had a lot to do with this too. 
They looked at the Jewish people as being no better than dogs. They were inferior people. They could not talk. No one was, was allowed to talk to the Jews. They certainly weren't supposed to intermarry because they weren't biologically able to even have procreate according to what the Germans said. But it's no different today. They still, the Jews still don't acknowledge the Lord as their Savior and their Messiah. But let me explain this to you. There's never going to be peace in Israel until the Lord comes back. There's always been a problem between Ishmael and Isaac. And the reason I say that is because the Arabs have vowed never to make peace with Israel. The United States, the United Nations, can offer land to Arabs that's not theirs to offer anyway. It's not going to help. Israel, during the past, has offered almost 100% of their land to the Arabs. Hasn't worked. Do you know why? The Arabs don't really want the land. All they want is for the Jews to be gone, to be annihilated, to be out of here, to be completely gone. They do not want the Jews. They will not recognize it. They will not give peace treaties with them. They will not even want to talk to them because they don't recognize them as people. They're very inferior. God said he would restore the land to Israel and it would happen in his time. But we need to continue to bless and pray for Israel. Then God said he would forgive our trespasses when we forgive others and when we are committed to him and his will. He doesn't wish that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. Let me tell you, the only reason that there is a place, a punishment for those who don't believe is because God is righteous. He cannot dwell among unrighteous. There is a difference. He has to make a distinction. We are not righteous because of ourselves. We have done nothing worthy of what God has given us. We are righteous only in Him. Paul said in Romans chapter 3, verse 10, There is none righteous, no, not one. That's pretty spoken, pretty plain. It says, and what he says will offend those who do not wish to believe the truth. There is a heaven to gain and a hell to avoid. Amen. G.K. Chesterton was a noted philosopher and theologian. Here's what he said. He said, Christianity has died many times and risen again, for it has a God who knows the way out of the grave. All the other gods that people have worshipped have all died. Where are they today? Still in the grave. Christianity is the only one, the only, the only belief that has a God where it's not in the grave anymore. He's gone. He's given us a promise. And since he's given us that promise, we have the same opportunity. We're going to be able to raise also, to be raised. God will restore his favor, righteousness, and power to his people. The last promise that God gave us, and I'll close, in the text he gave us, he said he will heal our land when we trust in him, by humbling ourselves, praying in sincerity, seeking his will, and turning from our wicked ways. He can heal our land because our, he can heal our land unless his people who claim to be committed to him start um, not really being according to his will. In other words, the only way that God is going to heal the land, and I'm talking about America right now, is if the Christians start praying. Why do you think that our president got in there the way he did? Do you think it was just by chance? Do you remember a few months back before the election, how the Christians all started praying and the churches began and, and pray for this, pray for this, keep praying. Somebody made a comment to them the other day and they said, I just wish that all those protesters and all the ones that are against the president would just go away. You know what my response to that was? I hope they don't. I wish it was a little easier. But let me tell you something. The church has been praying more the past year than we've prayed in a long time about our nation yeah. persecution will grow a church how many times have we seen this how many times have we talked about this unless a church I'm talking about the universal church unless a church has got some things going on and persecuted and have things going on their church is not going to, that's exactly what happened before World War II and that's exactly what's happening to our place today because we have not been praying we've let up We're assuming everything is going to be okay. 
Well, God can do whatever he wants to do. And sure, he can do it without our prayers. But what did he tell us to do? He said to pray. And he said to pray so that I can heal your land. In other words, we're not bargaining with God, but he said there's requirements if you're going to get the promise. Is the promise I'm going to give to you, is that worth the requirements I require of you? That's what he's asking you. Just recently, we were listening with the missionary gave us an account of a man in Iraq who'd been preaching. And at one time, um, he was arrested by the terrorist over there. This is in Iraq. This just happened just a few months back. He was arrested, and he was taken in. They questioned him. Well, after they questioned him, they executed him. How is the favorite type of, question, of execution right now? Do you know? Yeah. yeah. After that happened, a little bit of time passed, and the terrorist came and got hold of another missionary who was preaching put a hood over his head, put him into a car. He said, I know we drove a long ways. He said, I could tell that we were driving and driving and driving. Finally, we got to a location, he said. They took me into a building, took the hood off his head, had terrorists all around him, questioning him. But not only that, there was about 900 other ones in the building at the same time. They began to question this man by what he was doing. Well, he said, I'm preaching the word. You have to understand, he understood that he was fixing to die. He was praying. He said, Lord, I know it's coming <laughs> just any time, you know, pretty quick. But I'm going to keep on praying. I'm going to keep on trusting you. Mm-hmm. Pretty soon the terrorists began to ask him, are you the man? Are you the man? He said, what do you mean, am I the man? He said, are you the man? He said, after we kill that other man, he said, we all had dreams. I'm not talking about two or three or five or a dozen. All of them, 900 people, had the same dream. Just as a side note, the missionary we were talking to said, God reveals himself to the Arabs through this. Most of the time they get a dream first. And it's not the first time I've heard this. God will give a dream to them first that there's going to be a man come and talk to them about Jesus Christ. So, these people all in that room, they said, we've all had this dream that some man was going to come and talk to us about Jesus Christ. Are you the one? He said, yes. Wouldn't you say yes to? Yeah, I would. (laughs) He said, yes, I'm the one. They all got saved. That happened back in April of this year. Don't tell me that you don't have something to do. When God tells you something to do, you've got to trust him. That man thought he was going to lose his life within the next few minutes. But rather than lose his life, he was ready to give his life up. But rather than lose it, all those came to know the Lord. But that didn't start. It happened right there. First he had to pray. He had to humble himself. He had to seek the Lord. He had to turn from his wicked ways. When he did all that, then God went through with his promise. He heard the prayer. He forgave his sins. He healed the land. Do you see what I'm saying? God does this. (coughs) Jesus has promised to heal our land, meaning that he would give us a spiritual revival, but we have to get serious first about it. We have to really want it. We have to be committed to him regardless of the consequence we might face. Second Peter chapter 3, verse 9 says, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but he is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. How many did it say? All. Does that include everybody that hears this this morning? It includes everybody. Everybody. Anyone who seeks, it includes everybody. Even people are turning against him, it includes them too. Everybody's not going to accept it. So the question today is, to you, is the promise that God gives us worth the requirement that he requires of us? Is the promise of God worth the things that he requires of you, or do you think that he's being too demanding and too intolerant? God loves you enough to have sent his son one time to the cross of Calvary, one time for all the sins, all mankind, forever. That's good enough. Amen? 
the requirement he asked of us could never be too much for the promise that he's promised us to give us. Amen. God is good. God wishes that no one should perish. But there are some requirements we have to meet. And when you understand what those requirements are, it's not hard. The hardest thing is to get rid of the pride and get that out of the picture so that God can deal with us. And that was the very first thing he said, humble yourself. We humble ourselves and then God can use us. Amen. Amen. Let's bow our, our heads in prayer and go to the Lord in prayer this morning. Lord, we're so thankful this morning that you've given your word. We're so thankful, Lord, that you've been tolerant of us, that, Lord, you are forgiving, that you are you're more than willing to bless us, Lord. We just keep battering against your will too many times. We pray, Lord, this morning that you would give strength, that you would give encouragement for the ones who are having gone through trials this morning and temptations. Lord, I pray for each one of them this morning. Lord, you know what each what's, what is on each heart. So we have hearts this morning that are heavy because of things that we're going through. And we just pray this morning that you would touch those hearts this morning. That you would heal emotions. That you would heal financial problems, Lord. That you would heal situations. That you would heal bodies. Nothing, Lord, is too great for you. We just heard the testimony a while ago about how you healed a person and your, your, your blessings and spirit are with him after he had major surgery. Lord, that's nothing to you. Help us to realize this morning that whatever we bring to you is minor compared to what you can do. Help us to realize also that you are there for us, that you've already paid the price. We want to be sure to give you the thanks this morning, Lord for your faithfulness to us and for your salvation mostly. And now we just pray, Lord, that you would keep us in your word. Keep us, Lord, in a position where we can converse with you and know what your will is. We thank you, Lord, this morning when we ask these things and pray in your name and for your glory. Amen. Amen.